Okay, we're back to looking at the practice test four and going through a video solutions. Uh, looks like this one is done so that the test questions come up in a random order. So I have to go through here uh, and find which ones I've done before. I believe we did this one before in the first part. Um, we did not do this. Okay, so the journal reported study of homophone spelling in patients with a certain disease. 20 patients were asked to spell 24 homophone pairs in random order. Number of, of confusions was recorded for each patient. A year later, same test is given to the same patient. So we're going to have some paired data here. Do patients show a significant increase over time? Okay, so if we look at this, here's our data. We have two uh, data sets here and they are in pairs. Okay, so we're going to go over here to the calculator. Go to go to stat edit. We're going to use two pairs of data here. So I'm going to uh, clear out list one and list two. List one, I will put my first thing two, zero, uh, six, two, zero, two, and so forth. So that gets my time one entered. Go over to the list two. And of course, these need to be lined up as they are in the table so that we have before and after data on the same uh, line of my table or same entry in my list. Same order. Okay, and hopefully that is correct. Now we want to know differences, so list three, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here and put my cursor on list three, and I'm going to make that list two after minus list one. Um, and enter. And so the changes, amount of changes are in list three. If it's a negative, that meant it went down positive, it meant that measure went up. Okay, so notice we don't have any kind of, uh, of population, uh, standard deviation or variance. We also are looking at the level here, basically the amount. So we're looking at the mean amount. So we're testing for means. So this is a t-test, and it's a one sample t-test. Looks like we have two samples, but they're dependent, paired data. When we look at these differences, we really have uh, one sample of ordered pairs. So we're going to compute this as a one sample t-test, but using list three. So I go to stat, tests, t-test. We're going to do it from data. The null hypothesis is that there's no change, so that's zero for the, for the difference in means. So mu zero is the difference in the means, which is zero. Okay, and uh, the data is in list three, so there's L3, and we're testing the, the we, we hope the mean, or well, I don't know if we hope, the, the researcher thinks that the mean is actually larger than zero, so we're going to put greater than, so it's a one-tailed test. Calculate that, you can also draw it, of course. The test statistic is here, 1.77, uh, three decimal places, eight, 1.778. Okay, and we also have a p-value, and we can use that to make our conclusion. Uh, 0.045, uh, that is less than 0.05, the alpha. So p is less than alpha, we reject. So we say we reject h naught. There is sufficient evidence to, that the patients show a significant increase in mean uh, homophone confusion errors over time. Okay, 
and let's see what else we got here. Next question. Did that one earlier. Next. Okay, I don't remember if I did this one or not, so we'll do this. This is an F distribution. What we're doing is we're comparing the variances of two populations that are independent, uh, two samples, two samples. So we can, uh, that's built in, so we just go to stat, uh, test, go down to F test, and we go from stats this time. We have our summary statistics. Uh, S <coughs> for the men is 6.71. N is 123. S for the women is 6.93. And N2 is, uh, there are 112 of them. And we want to test to see. So we want to see whether sigma uh, square variance of the men is less than the females. Men is one, so that's a left tailed test. And the null hypothesis is that they're equal, and the alternative is here. So that's going to be uh, A. There's the correct thing. And we can run this test now. And our F statistic is 0.9. 375. The rejection region should be F is less than um, some value here that we can go get from. We'll have to go get this from a F distribution. Come back to that in just a second. If we look at the p-value, we can make our conclusion here. Our p-value is 0.36, so that was greater than 0.1. So there is, uh, we're not going to reject. Do not reject. There is insufficient evidence to indicate the variances are less there. What conditions are required? Well, the means of both, both the, the, the scores, the individual scores, must be uh, normal, and they're independent from normal samples. That's D. The other things here are not necessary. You don't have to have the number of, of sample sizes to be the same. In fact, we don't. We don't have to have the standard deviations the same. We don't have to have, you know, close together. So we can do that. The only thing we left to do is this one, and I believe this question is messed up a little bit. So I'm not 100% sure these things are going to grade correctly. Um, we should have an F, this is a left tail, so it should be F less than uh, some value here. Now to compute that, we're going to have to go to distribution. Actually, we're going to have to go, we're going to have to do an inverse F to get our critical value. Well, to do that, there's no inverse F built in. But our critical value is a left-tailed test, and we so we want 0.1 to the left of that. Okay, but we want to, want to graph our F CDF, and that we do have. So there's our F CDF, um, and we want to go from zero to x. An F distribution, like a chi-square distribution, uh, goes from zero onto the right. And in fact, it's very similar to chi-square distribution. And then we have to give it the two uh, degrees of freedom. So first one is the first variable. That's 122, n minus 1 for the men. And for the females, n minus 1 is 111. And we have to give it both of those parameters because there's a different f for, for both of those sets of, um, of um, degrees of freedom. So now if we... Uh, so let me look at our window. Uh, that's a good Y. Uh, this may be a decent window. I don't know. We'll have to see. So I'm going to do a calculate an intersection if I can. Let's see what the graph looks like. We should see an F distribution 
uh, for it's a CDF, so you should see it starting at zero here at the origin, and eventually making its way up to one. It's going to be a little slow here graphing, but looks like it's holding close to zero here for a while. Coming up, and should level off uh, at one. And of course, the um, the point one will graph as a horizontal line. We'll calculate the intersection, and then the F's that are less than that would be the rejection region. Okay. It's a little slow, but we'll get there. There we go. It's going to ask me for my two curves. I only have two, so that's pretty easy. Enter, enter, and then move over here. I can type in a number if I want, or just move over. Close for a guess. It will return the value we need. And the rejection region here should be to the left of this number. And that's point should be this should be a less than rather than a greater, and it should be point seven eight eight six. Okay, next question. Okay, haven't done this one yet. Hundred volunteers divide in two equal sized groups. Each volunteer took a math test and involved transforming strings of eight digits into a new string to fit a set of given rules, as well as a third hidden rule. Prior to taking the test, one group received eight hours of sleep while the other group stayed awake all night. The scientists monitored the volunteers to determine whether and when they figured out the rule. Of the volunteers who slept, 37 discovered the rule. The ones who stayed awake, 16 discovered the rule. Uh, what can you infer about the proportions of volunteers in the two groups who discovered the rule? The answer with a 95% confidence interval. So there were 50 in each group. We've got two samples. Uh, they are independent samples, and we want to uh, compare that. So, uh, also, it's fairly large groups. Uh, okay, so we can use a a two sample z proportion test or two proportion test. So we can go to stat test two proportion. Z test, which is number six. The number in the first group is 37. Uh, that had the, that were successful, and 50 of them uh, were in that group. Second group had only 16. Again, also out of 50, and we want to do. This is the right order, P1 and P, P2, and we want P1 minus P2 for the confidence interval. Okay, I should have done this as a confidence interval. Well, we're going to do this part here. The uh, We can do this, this here, and we want P1 greater than P2. This will give us a P value for this. And calculate find the interval, I have to do the, the corresponding interval. Uh, P value here is, see it's E negative 5, so that's point four zeros and a 1. That, that means there is sufficient evidence to say those who slept were better, a higher proportion. It's just at a significant level. Now if I go to stat and do test and do uh, two proportion interval, let's find that one, based on the Z distribution, Two proportion Z interval based on the Z uh, is, is this one. Uh, I think it'll transfer over my same stuff. That's good. I need to put in a confidence level, which is 95%. And there we go. 
so now we can do this to the nearest thousandth. So 0 0.24 to five thousandths, tenths, hundredths, thousandths, three places, two, four, three, and then point five nine seven. Um, I did this one earlier. I did this one earlier. No, I didn't do this one earlier. No, I did this. I did do this one earlier. Did that one earlier. Did that one earlier. Okay, here's a new one. So, we have a study of 51 hospital employees. They were diagnosed with a latex, latex allergy from exposure to, to the powder on latex gloves. And we also get the number of gloves used per week by the by the uh, workers, and we have some samples here, I mean, some statistics summarized. We have the mean and standard deviation from our sample, 19.8 and 12.3 respectively. We want to look at the variance uh, for all, and we're going to test variance is 100 against the variance not 100. So we have one sample contested test against a known distribution. We have to assume uh, if we assume that the original data is, is normal, then we can go ahead with a chi-square distribution. And this is one that's not built in, but we do have the chi-square CDF built in. So we're going to need that. Um, so we're, I'm going to do it by just finding the, well, it asks us to find the chi-square uh, test statistics. That's the first thing we do. So if you remember that is n minus 1 which is uh, 50 times the standard uh, it's times the variance actually which is 12.3 squared standard deviation squared and then uh, of a sample and we divide that by the standard deviation sorry the variance actually of the population which was uh, was assumed to be a hundred okay and there's our chi-square statistic, 75.645. Okay, and we want to check, uh, uh, it's a two-tailed test. So we want to compute a p-value, uh, 75, let's see here. Notice that 12.3 is already above, uh, well, Sigma for the population would be a hundred would be ten square root of a hundred. Twelve point three is bigger than that, so uh, we're already to the right. So we'll find the area from there on further to the right, and that will be half of our p value. So we'll need to double it. So what we need is two times, and then we need a a, a p value which we can get by going to distribution. This will compute the p value. So a probability to the right of this from a chi-square distribution, we use a chi-square CDF, and we're going from that point on over to infinity. So our previous answer on to infinity. I'm not sure what's good there. Let's just use, uh, let me start with a thousand. And we give it the degrees of freedom, which is 50. And this should be my p-value. Okay. So my p-value should be at least approximately 0 0.02. That's less than that, so we're going to reject. Uh, reject. There is sufficient evidence the variance is different. So that's going to be D. Uh, this one looks like they really want us to use a classical approach, so they want us to find the the rejection region. We need to find that um, that region. Now it's going to be whatever the values are. We're going to find our lower and our upper, and the rejection region is going to be when it's above the upper or below the lower. So the rejection region looks like either F 
or B. It's either F or B. We just got to figure out which one of these numbers is the right one to use. Okay, so to do that, we need an inverse chi-square. And to do that, we need to, uh, let's say we just want to find the area on the left. Now, this is a 0.05, so we do half of that's going to be left, so that's 0 0.025, 0 0.025 to the left. And we need a chi-square CDF here. So we're going to go here, and it's number 8. And the chi-square CDF goes from 0 up to x, and then in this case with uh, 50 degrees of freedom. And we want to calculate the intersection. I may not have a good, good window, but let's see. This is not this is not a good window. Okay, so let's look at our window, and we need to go about two and a half times the uh, degrees of freedom. So 50, or yeah, yeah. Let's so let's uh, say like 100 and well 125. Okay. And let's graph that. This will be a better looking window. Okay, now we want to find where these intersect. So we want to calculate the intersection there. That's correct first curve. There's a correct second curve. And I'm going to guess 10. And let's see. Actually, I should have guessed, based on these numbers, I should have guessed around 30 something. All right, 32.357. That looks like this one is the correct one here. We haven't checked the upper one yet. Let's go ahead and do that. And to check the upper one, we just need uh, 1 minus the 0 0.025, so that's 0 0.975. Do the same thing. Calculate an intersection. Again, I've got to wait for this to draw, but I'm pretty sure this is going to turn out to be right. Hopefully, if it doesn't, then there's not a right answer up there. Uh, but this this should be it. So we're going to do a calc intersect here, and we should get seventy one point four two zero two. Y will be 0.975, and sure enough, there we go, we got it, so that checks out. We've, uh, okay, describe a type 1 error. Uh, a type 1 error is when you reject, let's see, you reject the null hypothesis when it's really true. That's that. Think of our justice system analogy. That's type one is when you send an innocent person uh, to jail. Type two is the opposite. Um, in the justice analogy, it would be letting a guilty person go free. So it's failing to reject the null hypothesis when it's actually false. So then the alternative is actually true. Typo there. H. Number alpha represents the probability of a type 1 error. Beta is the probability of a type 2 error. And hypothesis tests are designed around controlling alpha. Uh, 
I did this one earlier. Uh, I believe we did this one earlier. Okay. All right. Suppose we're wanting to test h naught uh, mu equals 600 against alternative hypothesis mu is greater than 600, so it's a right-tailed test. Okay, so rejection region is going to look like C down here, a right-tailed test. Population is normally distributed with a standard deviation of 200. Random sample size 30 will be used. To complete these things. So, it's uh, the mean is going to be. So, assuming H naught is true, the mean is going to be 600. So, it's going to be uh, this one here, with 600 in the middle. Find the value such above which the null hypothesis will be rejected. So this is a rejection region based on, not on the Z, but based on the X's. So I'm going to go to here. I'm going to clear this out. And I'm actually going to graph this as well. Uh, in fact, we're going to make it uh, darker. So this is the null hypothesis. Uh, it gives us this normal distribution. So actually I can do it by... Okay, we can work this out. So we want to actually, I'll draw it in a minute. First thing I want to do is an inverse norm here to find the critical value. And of course we can do that since, since this was built in. We can just do an inverse norm. We want the, it's a one-tailed test and the alpha level is 0 0.05. So we went 0 0.05 to the left. Remember an in inverse norm you always put what's to the, I mean 0 0.05 is to the right inverse norm you always put what's to the left which is 0.95. Uh, in this case we want an x value not a z value that goes with that so we're going to give the hypothesized mean 600 and the hypothesized standard deviation 200. Now, be careful here, this would be for individuals. We're dealing with the sample. So we remember we have to divide that standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. So we're going to divide by square root of 30 there. So that's the uh, standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So this is a sampling distribution. This will give us our critical value for x, which is 660.1. Okay, and so that's this x value right here, and to the right of that's our rejection region with an area of alpha. Now, what if the actual distribution is uh, instead of 600, the mean is 650? What would it look like? So we're going to actually graph both of these graphs here. So the first one is a mean. Uh, it's a it's a normal distribution, so this will do. To graph it, we do normal PDF, and we just want to do uh, just x, and then we give it the mean and standard deviation. The mean was 600. Standard deviation was 200, again, divided by the square root of uh, whatever it was, 30. Okay. That's the original distribution. Okay. But now it says that was the hypothesized distribution. But it says, now what if the actual distribution uh, was here and the mean, same thing, but the mean was a little different. The only thing different is the mean. And the mean was 650. And same standard deviation. Okay, so the lighter, okay, so let's graph it. Uh, probably a bad choice of window. Let's try that again. So what would be a good window here? Well, let's see. It's centered up on on 600 or, or on 650. So let's go. Uh, and standard deviation of this is, uh, mm, let's see, what would that standard deviation be? 200 divided by square root of 30. Standard deviation is there. We go about four or five standard deviations from that. 
uh, we're going about 150 on either side. So if we go the top one 250 plus 150, that'd be a good top 400, and the 200 say minus 150. That's 50. That'll be a bottom. So about 50 to 400 would probably be good, uh, or I could go even longer, zero to something. So let's uh, let's go from um, 50 to 400. Maybe we'll mark that out in 50s. And uh, I don't need to go very high here. Let's see, point, I don't know. Let me see, point two, let's start with, and make this negative point zero three, zero five. Oh, I'm not nearly short enough. Okay, how far down do we need to go? Uh, let's take a look at our table. Let's set it up at um, 600. So I'm gonna look at my table, not that. This was about 50. Table set up. Let's start at around 600 and look at what kind of y value we get out of that table. Looks like 0 0.01 is about as tall as it gets. Okay, so 0 0.015. So now when I go to my window, that's going to tell me how tall I need to go. 0 0.015 is a little bit above that. Go about a tenth of that and make it negative here. 0 0.0. Zero, 02 let's try that so I'll give about a tenth of the screen at the bottom oh, something's still not right oh not 400 that's my problem I need to go up to uh, Oh, I needed to. Oh, no, these, these should be 650. 650 minus. Okay. 650 plus 150 should be my top. 800. And 600. Minus 150 should be my bottom. So, f say 400 to 800. Okay, this should be better. All right, there's our bell-shaped curve we're expecting. Okay, so that's the null hypothesis distribution. Then they're saying, suppose this is it. Now, our test statistic is 660.1, so let's actually draw a vertical there. So if I quit and say go to draw and draw a vertical, number four, at 660.1, enter there's where my test statistic is so this region if I if I shade from there to the right under the dark curve that's my area here like you see in, in C right here okay that's your out uh, basically that's your alpha well actually that's not alpha it's actually P but you would compare that to alpha No, it is. It actually is alpha because this is not our test statistic. This is our, this is our uh, critical value. So that is that is alpha. Now, take the same alpha level, go over to here. Beta is going to be to the left of this on the other curve. So it's going to look like, kind of like this one here. Okay, for beta. Okay, so find beta. So um, we can take this, and we want to do a. We can do this by shading it, okay, on here, or we can do it from just a, a normal CDF. So I'm gonna do it with a normal CDF. So we can do normal CDF. We want to go from. I think we said four. Let's see. Well, we want like ten standard deviations below the mean. So it's like 
650 uh, minus 10 times uh, standard deviation was 200 divided by square root of 35 or anything that's, that's beyond that's fine. And then we want to go up to our critical value which was 660.1 And our mean was 650 now, because we're using a different distribution now. And the standard deviation, again, is 200 divided by square root of 35, I believe. That's the population standard deviation, 200 divided by square root of 30, it should say. So these should be 30s. Sample size is 30. That should do it. Or we could have done it by shading on the graph. And we get beta is 0 0.6090 when we round to four places. And the power is 1 minus that. So 1 minus our previous answer will give us the power of 0.3910. You want, first of all, we want a small alpha. That's the most important thing, and that's what the test is designed around. And then ideally what you would have is a small beta as well, and that, of course that would make a large power. Okay, this one here, we have... Um, Looks like we got uh, 10 subjects. We got before and after data from here. So we got paired data. And we don't have anything about um, population standard deviation. So this is going to, and we're, we're comparing the differences in means, mean changes, and so forth, confidence intervals for the means. So we're going to be using a Two sample, no, one sample t test, just a regular t test, and a t interval for this. But we're going to be doing it on the differences. So I'm going to go here to stat edit. Uh, we can use these same lists again, or I can use different ones. I'll just use list four, five, and six this time. So put in the first one: two ninety-five, two seventy-nine. List 5 is the other group, the after data, 265, 266, 240, 240, and so forth. So it's a good, chance, good idea to take the chance now to go back and recheck your data entry. Well, list six is going to be the difference. Oh no, look at this. I thought I was at the top of the list and they were empty. Here, I should have cleared these lists out. This is not good. I can fix it though. I can just delete the stuff that's at the top. Should have cleared my lists out first. I just thought they were already empty. Good idea to always clear your list first.
Okay, so list six, we're going to make that list five minus list four. Okay, so it's after minus before. So a negative means a decrease, a positive means an increase. Okay. Now, um, it asks us for some statistics, which we can do by doing one variable statistics on list six, but it's actually going to come out when we do some of these other things, like a confidence level, confidence interval. So let's do a confidence interval. It's a T interval, so I can just do that with stat test. Go to T interval, which is number eight. And we're going to input our from data. Our list is list six is where our data is. So notice again, this is since you have paired data, this is really one sample. The confidence level is 0 .90, 90 90%. And we're going to calculate that. This is also going to return the mean and the standard deviation for us. So the sample mean is negative 26.8. The sample um, standard deviation, 24.0638, four decimal places. 90% confidence interval, negative 40.75 to negative 12.85. So on average, they lost 26.8 pounds, uh, not pounds, what is this, cholesterol, uh, whatever, the cholesterol level went down by 26.8 units and had a standard deviation of changes of 24 point something units. We're 90% confident the actual mean amount of change in cholesterol levels should be somewhere between negative 40.75 and negative 12.85. The p-value, we need to do one more test on that, so now we need to do a t-test. And we can do a t-test again from uh, data, and we're testing if it's effective in reducing. So the null hypothesis is no change, and we want it to reduce, so we want it to be less than that. So we're going to use a left tail test. We could draw it as well if we want. I'm just going to calculate it. And again, it's going to return the same mean and standard deviation. Sample size is 10. And it, but the thing that we, we get out of this is a p-value. 0, 0, 3, 2, 5. So at alpha is 0 0.01, is there enough? evidence? Yeah, this is smaller, so yes, there is enough evidence to say this was an effective uh, treatment. I believe between this video and the other one that I gave, we have worked through all of these uh, examples. Hopefully this will help you study for the exam.